hurt people hurt people so mm. that was all they knew you know so that was all that they could share and that's why we have to work as a community to make our community health i have a higher power that's looking out for me and when i look back i see the times that they did look out for me community is the most important you know what i mean having the, the, the community around you rally around you you know it feels really mm -hmm. good Welcome everybody to the Rally Cry Podcast. My name is Angel. And my name is Tyler. And you guys are here because you want to learn, you want to grow, and you want to move from the past, and you want to live in this moment. And in this moment, we have a guest. But before I introduce you to this guest, I want to make sure that you guys follow us on Instagram at The Rally Cries, and also follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Let us know, is there something that we haven't talked about, or is there something that we haven't talked about enough? Mm. And... So everybody, our guest today is someone that she's a professional. Um, she has experience with all kinds of therapies, such as dialectical, dialectical therapy. She had cognitive behavior therapy and all the other experiences of therapy. Um, she's also uh, a city councilwoman and she's a big advocate for the community and bringing them together and the importance of that because there is no community without unity. So everybody, welcome Zeta Govin. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. How, how's everything so far? Everything is good. Everything's good. Things are going along. Yes, yes. And I, I'm truly excited. I know we talked a little bit um, between us, um, but today we want to talk about, like, what do you do? Why do you do it? And just to introduce our audience um, to you. So um, I know when it comes to social work, because you're independently licensed, um, there's always a story what made you want to do that and help the people, because a lot of people... Um, don't really have social workers that really want to advocate for the community. So what, what is your background story? What made you want to do that? Well, um, it started a very long time ago, although I'm only like 20. Um, <laughs> um, I uh, grew up in Springfield. I came here from Puerto Rico when I was three years old. My parents brought me. Um, I'm the oldest of five, of five children. I have four brothers and, mm. you know, came up in the Springfield public school system. I loved school. Um, I've always wanted to be like a professional, like go to business school and things like that. Um, as you know, things happen in life. I, um, in high school, I remember my guidance counselor, um, you know, coming or talking to me and I had straight A's in school. I was a great student. I loved to go to school. That was my favorite thing to do. Um, because at home, all I could do was stay in my room or, you know, because I wasn't allowed to go out. So anyways, mm. I was in school and the guidance counselor said to me, oh, what? Well, I don't think you should apply to go to college, you know, mm. even though my grades were straight A's. Um, and I didn't understand it at the time. Of course, I didn't listen to her and I applied for college and I did get a full four year scholarship to go to Springfield College, mm. um, the school here in Springfield. Of course, I was, you know, dumb, 17 in love, allegedly, um, and I did <laughs> decline that scholarship. And I went all the way to South Carolina to go to school following a boy um, mm. and that didn't work out. So that's where I started my college career at the University of South Carolina in mm. Columbia, South Carolina. And I had to drop out. A lot of things happened. Some traumatic stuff happened. And um, I ended up living in Florida for a minute until I came back home to live with my parents. I had been, I got pregnant and I had my first daughter. Um, so after that, you know, I kept trying to just get jobs and do different things. Um, and I couldn't really find anything. And I ended up actually falling into a life of addiction. Um, and I became addicted to, um, basically crack cocaine in the 80s, right? 80s, yeah. I got clean in 1989, May 8th, 1989. Don't forget that date. Um, <laughs> so it's almost coming up on 34, maybe 35 years. So um, since I got clean, I started noticing the injustices, right? I know I remembered my guidance counselor telling me that, and I didn't know why at the time, but now I know why. You know, my parents, they don't have a fifth grade education combined. Um, they, I was raised with both my parents, my mother and my father. He worked, you know, all his life at Columbia Bicycle Factory. And um, they speak still today very little English. Um, but they raised us, you know, and they, we did good. Um, 
And I think that's the reason that the guidance counselor didn't think that I should go to college. Plus, I was a Puerto Rican girl from the north end of Springfield, um, you know, thinking I could do something. <laughs> and of course, it was a white guidance counselor. Um, and I saw things like that. And then when I got clean, I remember being in a program um, because I had to get into a program. I had my two, I had two children at that time, and I had fought DCF in my life and everything. And I was in program, a six month program. Um, I had been there for three months and I had charges. Of course, when you're out there, you get charges. So I had gotten some charges and um, I went to court one day. I was three months clean, had a full-time job um, and I was getting ready to get my kids back. And I went in front of the judge. I will say it's an old white guy. It was a Friday, September, I want to say 9th, 1989. And I went in front of him expecting, right, that, oh, you have a job, you're clean, you're doing well. He took me out of the program that day and sent me to prison, um, Framingham MCI, uh, Mass Correctional Institution. So I what? was three months clean, actually in September, May, June, July, August, September. I was four months clean, and he took me out of there and sent me to prison. Again, I'm Puerto Rican, you know, this Puerto Rican girl, and, you know, he's thinking – whatever. I think he had a bad week or something was going on, you know, whatever. Right. Um, and he sent me to Framingham for two years. I was sentenced. One was suspended One I had to serve. So I ended up going to Framingham. Um, the, you know, the women's correctional institution at the time, we didn't have the Chicopee um, site at that time. And, um, I started doing my time. It was hard, right? Just doing time is hard, I think. Um, and I was there for like six months and they said I would be eligible for parole in six months. And um, I wasn't getting my parole in six months. I was freaking out, right? So I think in March, I ended up being able to be released. And I remember again, right? They gave me, I think like $90 and put me on a train from Framingham to Springfield. And I said, you know, when I, after I got clean and, and I started, you know, thinking about this, I said, that's an injustice, right? How are you going to let somebody out of jail after six, seven months with $90 and no guidance, you know? Um, so those are the kind of things that made me want to do the community work that I started doing almost immediately. Um, I actually started working at that time with the HIV AIDS population, which was a, a pandemic, an epidemic back then. Um, and I started doing case management, you know, helping people with HIV, try to get educated. Um, and that was my first job after I got out of prison. Um, mm. And again, you know, um, the system, what I always talk about that works exactly as it was, as it was, as it was intended to do, um, is working perfectly for everybody else, but not for us. Um, and that's when I started fighting the system, <laughs> you know. Um, right. I started trying to, you know, change things. And I actually ended up getting a job at the prison in Connecticut. <laughs> wow, look at that. <laughs> I was from, from prison to prison. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and that didn't work out because, of course, the systemic uh, injustices in there made me have to quit after five years. You know, I saw people, the, the guards would, um, they had a noose hung and they had a black guy in the office and they were like threatening basically to hang him. And, you know, that's what? awful terrible i had to quit because those guys got um promoted so i'm gonna leave wow. it there let you guys <laughs> process oh. that yeah, right? like, wow <laughs> like need to... like there's so many questions that i have and like oh. like already like clearly racism was a big mm -hmm. intricate integral part in this whole situation especially yes. you being sentenced to jail and you know you were clean and you you got a job so like doing the things that a regular civilian could do what made you such a threat by doing the thing that you were supposed to do, which is get clean. Mm -hmm. Melanin, right? My skin yeah. color, my name. Um, wow. So I read somewhere, some, um, something somewhere, um, somebody said that, you know, as black and brown people, our weapon is our skin color. And so that means that we're never unarmed. And that's what the system looks at, you know, and mm -hmm. that I believe that that's what happened. Wow. That's yeah, a great that's... point. That's a very great point. And like, I was, I was going to ask, um, at least during this whole time and being that you moved to South Carolina, rejected the Springfield College uh, scholarship and everything that you had going over here, was your family any part of this? Like, did, was there like a disconnect at, at any point, especially moving to South Carolina? Yeah. Um, so I was raised, like I said, I'm the oldest 
girl in a uh, home of five. I have four brothers. And I think our, my parents, our parents, because they're all our parents, <laughs> my five brothers, four brothers. Um, so our parents, I think their goal was only to get us to 18 and then buy, right? Mm. So they never, my mother, although I have to give it to my mother. When I was four years old, she taught me how to read in Spanish because she knew that once I went into the school system, I was going to learn English and maybe not you know, realize the Spanish. So she taught me how to read before I went into kindergarten, which I give all credit to her. And she didn't have a fifth grade education. Um, so I think their goal was to get us to 18 and leave, right? So at 18, that's what I did. I left and they didn't really know about college. They weren't able to help with paying for any, any of it. Um, so that wasn't an expectation ever for us, right? Mm -hmm. My three brothers graduated from high school and joined the military right after, right? So like the next day they were joining the Air Force and they did. Um, the only, the baby brother, he it was born like later, way later. The year I graduated from college, he was born the year before. So he was only two when I left. Mm -hmm. um, so he's the only one that I think at 18 wasn't expected to leave, although he did. <laughs> and he's in California right now, actually, oh. um, doing some tech work and stuff like that. So, nice. yeah, so the family, it wasn't necessarily. Um, plus, I have to say this, uh, my mother was a Jehovah Witness and my father wasn't. So, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, they don't interact with the world, world, um, you know, so we never had birthday parties. We didn't really um, get with our family a lot because, you know, holidays mm. is when you get together with your families, right? right. Mm -hmm. And as Jehovah Witnesses, you don't do that. So we were disconnected a little bit from the, our um, extended families, my cousins and stuff like that. So we're just now, you know, seeing each other and, and trying to connect mm. like that. So, yeah. So that, I think that was a disconnect there. Um, and to this day, you know, my parents live in Florida. We just, all my brothers and myself went down to Florida and saw them, um, in January. And that's the first time that's happened since probably we graduated from college when they saw all of us at one time. Wow. So wow. we're still trying. <laughs> hey, you got an awesome story just because like going back to how much adversity you went through, mm. um, you have to have a really strong mindset for that, like a lot of resilience. And I think even around the time that we live now, people are not really good at adversity, right? Mm -hmm. I think the first question they ask themselves is like, oh, why me? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask, like, when you were going through all these adversities, what is something that kept you going? I don't know, honestly. It was, I think, because I knew that I was the only one that I could count on. You know what I mean? So I'm the only one I had. I could probably call my mother and cry to her, and but she couldn't do anything. You know, they didn't have money like that. They didn't have resources like that. So I think it was because I knew that it was just me. You know what I mean? Um, and then I, I felt bad after I got clean and, and came back to the community. I felt bad for other people who maybe were in the same situation, right? And if there was something I can do to help somebody, I think that was my mindset to try to always, you know, keep moving forward and, and helping other people see the same thing. Yeah. And that's, that's amazing because I think there's a quote, there's a quote that I heard and is that, you know, you are more than capable to help the people you once were mm -hmm. and you was once were a person in this position. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like, now that you're able to be in this experience, you're like, Hey, like, I know what you're going through. I might not know exactly what it is and you, we might be a little bit different, but like, let's work together. Let's right. figure it out because we can't stay here forever. And I don't want you to stay here forever because if it was me, I wouldn't want to be there. Right. And mm -hmm. I think it's amazing that you wanted to do that and try to help people and being uh, a communist, right. Or activist, right. Just being actively trying to help everybody's mm -hmm. important. And how long have you been doing that now, um, helping with the community? Probably over 30, 30 years, right? Um, like I said, I, as soon as I got out of the jail after two years clean, um, I started working with HIV, AIDS um, community. Um, I, went, I worked at the prison. And then after that, I realized after the prison that I, I needed a degree, right? I tried to go to Springfield College and get that scholarship. Ah, <laughs> but I wasn't there. Got you. <laughs> so I ended up, you know, getting student loans. And I did get my bachelor's. I got my master's degree. Um, you know, and I, I knew that it was only with a degree, unfortunately, that people really, you know, can listen to you. 
you know, uh, because we know what we know, right? You guys mm-hmm. probably are able to make some big changes, but nobody's really going to pay attention if you don't have a degree, which is sad, right? right. It's yeah. so expensive to get one. Um, mm-hmm. So that's another fight that we might fight one day. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, there's there's so many challenges um, that people deal with, mm-hmm. um, like anxiety um, and depression. And with times like that, I'm sure how ang- how much your anxiety levels were and how depressed you may have felt because you felt like no one was uh, in your corner, um, especially with family. I think um, family is the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. And when we're trying to make a community, we're kind of trying to make that like family, mm-hmm. um, to respect one another, to love one another, to understand one another in a way where we can try to help, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how, how important is community to you um, during your times of adversity? I think community is the most important. You know what I mean? Um, like you said, having the, the, the community around you rally around you, you know, it feels really mm-hmm. good um, to know that people are there for you, you know, and they might not be blood family, but they're like your chosen family. Um, and, and I actually saw that, you know, uh, two years ago, my son unfortunately died of an of an overdose, an accidental fentanyl overdose, and that's Sorry another that. story. Sorry. But the community that came around when that happened for me, um, it was the only thing I think that got me through, and that is continuing to get me through because I'm not through it yet. I'm not, you know, processing all all of it yet. Um, but the community is what keeps you going, I think, you know, and when I think back to those times, like when I was in Florida, I didn't have a community, right? I didn't have that's why I had to come back home to my mother. Right. Um, and then after that, when I got into addiction again, that I didn't have the community. That's how I, I was, you know, fell into it. When I got into addiction, I was, um, going to stick actually getting a degree. I was working and I had my two kids and my neighbor, um, you know, saw how exhausted I was basically. And they, she said, Oh, take this and it'll help you have energy cocaine. Right. And I did mm. stupidly, um, and I got addicted. But that was the community. You know what I mean? Mm. That wasn't very helpful. Instead of saying, "Oh, you know, let me take care of the kids while you maybe get some rest," that was their solution. Um, but again, you know, hurt people hurt people. So mm. that was all they knew. You know, so that was all that they could share. And that's why we have to work as a community to make our community healthy. So then when I see you suffering, I'm not going to offer you a drink or offer you a drug, but I'm going to offer you a listening ear. You know what I mean? Um, Maybe some resources that you might be able to take advantage of. And that's how I believe that as a community, we're all going to be okay. You know, because as long as we have each other, we have the resources that we need, we're going to be okay eventually. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love yeah. that. Um, I would say too, a lot of times when we're trying to find help or resources, an individual might not know where to go, mm-hmm. and they may feel alone. What would you give it? What what, what kind of advice would you give someone that is trying to get in the community, but a community that's healthy for them? Like, what is something that they will also look for? Yeah, yeah. I think um, it is hard to find healthy people right because we're all you know this system has torn us down so everybody's hurting to a degree right um so i think looking especially say in springfield right um go uh, i'm afraid to tell you to go to your neighborhood council because not all of them are healthy (laughs) um but that might be somewhere to start right um we have a 211 system in massachusetts and i think it's world uh, nationwide uh, where you could call 211 and if you need food right they'll give you a list of food pantries if you need um i don't know mental health care they'll give you some resources that you can use you know so using those um tools that we have access to i think would be helpful to tell somebody right if you know a therapist you know oh, go to listening with love they can help you there right or you know go to the city council or go to the state rep you know if you have a A perfect example, of course, you know, the pandemic, we went through a lot of people became unemployed and a lot of people had to go on unemployment and Mm -hmm. unemployment in Massachusetts, for some reason, doesn't answer the phone. They don't have an email address you could reach out to. There's nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to call the state rep to get anything done, you know, but nobody knows that. 
You know what I mean? So mm. telling someone, well, call your state rep, call the you know, chief of staff. They can help you and they will help you, you mm. know, but knowing that, you know, and that's one of my things is trying to get the information out there. Um, like just most recently on the city council, we've been going on tours telling people about a circuit breaker program, which is um, for seniors over 65 years of age that could get help for their property taxes. You know, a lot of people are struggling um, or telling people about some different programs that the city has to help them with their property taxes. If people don't know about them, they're not going to be able to use them, you know, so having access to information is important. So that's why what you guys are doing is excellent because you're spreading the word. I don't understand it totally, <laughs> but you're spreading the word and you're letting people know about different things. And that's vital. That's important. Yeah, it's definitely yeah I, I, I appreciate that. And like, you know, thank you for the recognition. And something I was going to say, you know, like at least when it comes to adversity and especially I didn't even know myself uh, that reaching out to the city council would help with something like unemployment because when everybody was getting unemployment during COVID, I wasn't. And I had to wait for an appeal because even though I was applying to jobs and registering that in the system, they still weren't allowing me to get any any feedback as far as like, am I eligible or not? And it wasn't until we were done with COVID and probably on the third or fourth variant of it that I finally got to go through with that meeting. And I was already at work. I was already going to school again. So it was like all of this time, it took that long just to get uh, get a conversation with somebody. And it was like, where was it back then? And when it comes to adversity like that and dealing with uh, such detrimental things, I wanted to ask, you know, um, as far as your mother being a Jehovah's Witness, what was uh, your connection spiritually like if you did believe in any religion? Did you pray? What helped you get through those days and nights? Yeah. Um, so growing up, I, I was a Jehovah Witness. I actually got baptized. I would go knock on doors <laughs> until I was 18. The day I turned 18, that was it was over, you know. Um, <laughs> however, I didn't pray right after that because I was afraid. Because in Jehovah Witness, they teach you that if you go to anywhere else, like if you go into a church, it's like the worst thing you could do in your whole life. Um, so I didn't wow. do that, you know, um, and it was kind of like um, brainwashing to a degree, right, where they teach you these things and you can't talk to anybody that's not a Jehovah Witness. And if they've been disfellowshipped, oh, my God, that's like the worst thing you can do. Um, so that was hard for me because I didn't have a God that I believed in, right? Until I came into recovery. When I came into recovery, I learned through Narcotics Anonymous that I have a higher power that's looking out for me. And when I look back, I see the times that they did look out for me. And then today I believe in God. I'm a Christian, you know, my Lord and Savior and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but it took me some time to get there because of the trauma of being a Jehovah Witness and what they teach you, you know. Um, church hurt is real hurt. Mm, yeah, I agree. Like, mm -hmm. I think even for myself, you know, as growing up, you know, I always believed that there was a higher power, but having not too much of an understanding for it and how much um, healing there is in that. Uh, I mm -hmm. think for the past couple of years, I'm 25 now, um, I've realized of how much gratitude brings with, mm -hmm. you know, with God and how God is good. And, you know, mm -hmm. you just got to be patient, you yeah. know, in a way with him. And I think there's a lot of people that might not believe in God right. and I think it's really important to believe in something mm -hmm. because believing um, is seeing rather than seeing is believing right. a lot of people want to see something to work before they think it is yeah. and it's like well you have to have some form of like confidence with mm -hmm. yourself right mm -hmm. be confident that something's going to work out for you for the better mm -hmm. and I think that when we're able to start somewhere and love ourselves. And that's when we were able to build relationships with one another. I think adversities, like how you went through, how Tyler and me probably went through, and all of them being different, that there's still adversity themselves. It's still the challenge itself. Um, but we do so much comparing in the community. Like, oh, you have this. I, you have that. And it's kind of like that's not what makes a community. Right. A community is so much bigger than that. It's kind of like, oh, you don't have this? Well, maybe this is where you can go. Right. All right. And I, I love that you, you gave that number. It was two one one, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So if you need any resources, yes. anyone that is listening, like 
If you need any food food pantries yep, or anything, anything like that, the mental health, 211 is that number. You could call that number, mm -hmm. especially, I don't know if it's different for other places, but I know here in Springfield, it's, that's 211. Yeah, and it might be nationwide, mm, you know, okay. if you call 211. And it's like if you have trouble paying your gas, light bills. Look at that. Those mm. That number, I'm telling you, not not a lot of people know about it. I you didn't know? even. So, yeah, so getting that, and so, so thank you all so much for getting that information out, you know, because ha college students, right? Yeah. I just read an article that college students are, like, starving because they're living on campus. They don't have enough money to buy food. They might not have a meal plan or their meal plan runs out. And where are the resources, right? So mm -hmm. college students could call that number and maybe find a food pantry that can give them some canned goods or whatever, you know? Right, and then be grateful for that. Exactly. You know, you know what I mean. I think exactly. there's also people out there that would be like, "Oh, well, it's not enough." And mm -hmm. it's like, "Well, you know, a little bit is better than nothing." Absolutely. You know, because mm -hmm. I'm I'm a college student right now, and it's hard mm -hmm. having a mm -hmm. meal pa uh, a meal plan, prepping things if I can. Right. Um, but like having that number, I might have to look at that myself yes. because I want to see what it could do for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Um. So no, yeah, I, again, I, appreciate that. I love that. You know, we're talking about this because. Last year, before I left Springfield, being at Stick, I, I learned that Student Success Services, they have that now. When mm. me and Angel originally started at Stick, before I left, I wasn't aware of anything like that. And when I got back, they have a food pantry. They can even help, help out with bills. Like, let's say if your car breaks down and that's and you have to commute to, to school or maybe to work, they could potentially help you out with things like that. Mm -hmm. So it is possible and there is a change. It's also, what kind of plans do they have to make that sustainable so that way it could, you know, continue long enough to help out the kids? Because another thing in Springfield, like I was, uh, I took a sustainability in agriculture and an issue is that there's not enough whole food stores mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, you could have canned goods, canned goods could get you a long way. However, other things that aren't as uh, nutritious and things that could uh, do well for the body, there's not enough of that around, yes. especially, I mean, the time of year that you guys have right now as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why growing your own food, right? And growing food anywhere. So I was part of a um, community garden push back in 2010 where we were growing community gardens all over the city, right? Mm. So we had uh, the Bay Street. Uh, community garden mason square community garden which is now at the mason square library um there's one in um, forest park there's a community garden and have helping people build maybe a little garden in their backyard right so during the times from may the end of may we'll say <laughs> up here in new england um till about september october you could be growing your own food you don't have to buy it you know you buy get some seeds or get a little plants get tomatoes lettuce cucumbers peppers you know you could grow everything all that stuff here. I wish we could grow some Puerto Rican stuff, but we can't. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> the, weather, the weather is crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and then teaching people how to do that, right? Because people think, oh, my God, I can't do a garden. But it's not that hard. Um, you just need a little bit of space and maybe someone to help you, you know. So we were big on teaching people how to grow their own food because you're right. Our whole foods and then they're tr they try to be more expensive, right? Although now McDonald's is just as expensive as, as everything else. Yeah. So it doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a greenhouse in Indian Orchard, which is a hydroponic greenhouse. It's called Wellspring Harvest and they grow lettuce uh, from with water, not dirt. Um, which is oh. really cool, and it's a whole greenhouse. You guys got to go see it if you get a chance. Yeah, I would um, love to. I'll give you a tour of it. I'm what? on the board. Oh, um, even better. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. nice. But, you know, things like that, again, people don't know about it, right? And how right. are we going to get the word out? That's I'm big on getting um, wow. people to get information and to work together. I'm big on collaboration. So I did just look up 211.org, actually. So it is nationwide. Wow, look at that. That's, wow. that's beautiful. And like, you, you know, yes. another thing too, uh, a toxic culture that's like in today's age is a uh, gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. So people oh, could God. find good stuff like that, but then they're too stubborn or selfish mm -hmm. to want to like reveal it to anybody else because then everybody else is going to go and they want to feel some sense of uh, entitlement yeah. or maybe a possessiveness towards mm -hmm. them finding this gold mine. And, right. you know, it's not fair. <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. why we need to be able to commute together to make the community. And I, I also believe that at, as long as like we keep that helpful eye out for each other and we continue to produce that more and more, things can get easier. So that way, 
adversities that you faced won't happen to people nowadays, which I'm exactly. sure, you know, it's probably less likely because crack cocaine isn't as big as much as it mm -hmm. was. But now we have other drugs and other yes. things, substances that are being put out to the streets. So it's like how are 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds getting the help that they need and having enough shelters to give them the support and help that they need as well. Absolutely. Yeah, honestly. And, you know, I, I know that we were talking before we uh, we went air. Um, Zeta does have somewhere that she has to be. So we're going to um, start with the rally for qui cry questions. Mm, oh, um, cry. Cry, right? <laughs> rally for oh, cry. cry. Ah. <laughs> rally for cry. So we have four questions, right? And uh, you could answer it to a one word minimum to a sentence maximum. Um, it goes a little over. That's okay. Um, so to my first question, um, what is the best advice you ever received? Hmm. I don't know. I don't mm. know. Or it could be, what is the advice you give yourself? That was the best. I think being okay with not knowing. Right. Mm. And I'll leave it there. I love that being okay with not knowing Simple. and then so I don't know is is the best advice I've ever gotten <laughs> that's deep you gotta really it, think on that. It, it leaves you room to be curious it leaves you room yeah. to wander and it leaves you room to now learn from the learn. mistakes exactly exactly mm. Mm -hmm. wow I love that one I love that because I could resent I could resonate with that I'd be like not knowing I'm ah, I need yeah. more. and you don't have to freak out it's okay mm -hmm. to not know yeah it's true um okay so the second question would be what is the best advice? I mean, no, I'm sorry. What is the worst advice you ever received? That I did not take was don't go to college. Mm. Don't go to college. Yes. I mean, that is the worst one, to be honest. It's, especially as a, as a student and you're getting not even just good grades, but you're getting straight right. A's and everything yeah. like that. So you would think at, as someone oh. that's getting straight A's, why, why wouldn't I try to get a scholarship right. so that way right. I don't have to pay for college? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And nobody guided me and told me, oh, wait, this is a four year scholarship. You shouldn't go to South Carolina. You know, nobody said that to me. If somebody would have said that to me, maybe I would have kept it. I would have gone there um, mm -hmm. and let that boy go. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Tyler, okay. do you have two? For us, yes, or... I do. Of course oh. I do. This is the rally, okay. my brother. Let's do this. All right. So Zayda, All right. when you get good news, who's the first person you go to? Mm, probably my husband nice yeah you know companionship you know it's and the excitement especially when you come home after work and be like mm -hmm. you're not gonna believe what i have to tell you yeah yeah and it's good to have the support too it's real close to home someone that mm -hmm. you know you built relationship with um of course there's parents and stuff like that that we could say um but definitely having that significant other yeah. is big Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Find one, guys. Let's do, 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 do. Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you can make one law that everyone had to follow, what would it be? Be kind. I know it sounds corny, but. It's true, though. We, you know, we... just be kind to each other. I think if we were all kind to each other, the world would be totally different, right? We would not have israel bombing palestine we would not have russia mm -hmm. doing ukraine we would not have hunger in this country you know yeah i agree i, I think see if, if we take it that. one if we take it one day at a time we can listen with love as yeah. your independent study it is we can listen with love <laughs> absolutely yes everybody i hope that you guys got something from it um i think me and tyler definitely have um, it's all about listening with love. And by the way, you know, we're saying that because that is a Zeta's independent study. So if you want to go um, be listened with love, you can go see her. I'll make sure I leave a link down below so, you know, you could contact her if you need anything. Uh, but she's she's a great person. Um, she's very kind herself and she's really big on community. And I think we all should be with sharing resources, stop gatekeeping and mm -hmm. just be able to be loving and caring with one another and understanding. And just because we're different, that doesn't mean anything. We're actually similar because we're people mm -hmm. and we all mm -hmm. go through adversity. So yeah, guys, we, we really do appreciate you guys. Please leave a, uh, 
like if you enjoyed this episode please leave a review uh, tell us what you think follow us on instagram at the rally cries and make sure that you follow us on your favorite podcast platform until next time make sure you take one step at a time and one day at a time peace peace see ya (laughs) 